everyone good evening and thank you for joining us uh, on a friday evening uh, on a rainy day in mumbai and i'm told it's pouring heavily in kottayam as well uh, i hope uh, we'll make your uh, weekend worthwhile with this uh, interesting chat with one of the leading ladies in our uh, digital ecosystem in india as many of you know mariam matthew is the ceo of malayalam manorama online she's been instrumental in you know leading the digital initiatives of the group uh interestingly uh, this is something i did not know i must confess malayalam manorama was one of the early entrants in the digital space uh, they set up their digital arm 24 years back which uh, makes it late 90s when most of us were trying to figure out uh, uh, what digital means malayalam manorama as you all know is a is one of india's oldest publications it was established in 1888 which is exactly now it makes it 132 years it has a daily circulation of 2.31 million and has over 40 publications the group also runs manorama news a 24 hour news channel manorama max an entertainment channel and radio mango fm stations in kerala malayalam manorama also the online business that uh, mariam leads also attracts 36 million unique visitors a month which is a fairly significant number given the size of the population in kerala Malayalam Manorama Online is the top Malayalam news web website. The news portal comprises of almost 30 dedicated channels from news to movies to technology and features. And as some of you might know, Malayalam Manorama is also a pioneer in setting up classified business in their respective digital spaces. No wonder they, they're a very heavily awarded uh, company. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I don't think we have time to go through their list of awards, but just to mention a few classified businesses they run, which is their matrimonial business called M for Mary, the education por portal called Man Manorama Horizon, Hello Address, which is Kerala-based exclusive real estate portal, Quick Kerala, Kerala's own business search engine, QK, QK Doc, Kerala's hospital appoint appointment app. Uh, all of this and more is under uh, uh, Mariam's portfolio. She's an alumna of St. Stephen's College in Delhi, from where she did her BA economics, and uh, she's also an MBA from the Carnegie Mellon University, Pittsburgh. Before Malayalam Manorma, Mariam worked with J.P. Chase Morgan in New York. Thank you, uh, Mariam, for joining us uh, on a rainy evening. Good to have you here. Very interested to know what you're doing uh, in uh, leading the Malayalam Manorma's digital initiatives. Before I get to that, let me just ask you briefly, though, there's been enough said and written about that. Belated happy Onam to you, first of all. How's been the Onam season in Kerala? Onam season, uh, for it depends on what product you're talking about. For digital, it's been very good. Um, you know, we've had, uh, like we were talking about just before we got in, uh, Kerala has been going through some interesting ups and downs in the last uh, few years. And our, uh, just before the Onam season is our rainy season. And the last few years, we've had floods. So, which is, you know, Onam season is normally a peak season when it comes to revenue. So, it, it has kind of, uh, it affected us in many ways. But uh, what I always talk about is the incredible spirit of uh, Malayalis and people from Kerala. They have this, uh, you know, there is a concept of coming together and building up and pushing it up. So really, um, over the years, despite the floods and despite COVID and everything else, uh, there is a spirit which kind of is pushing this uh, state together, having said that. Uh, I mean, we are all suffering in terms of the economy, uh, especially travel and tourism this year, because... Uh, you know, that is a large percentage of our revenues, um, travel and tourism, and even medical tourism, because a lot of people come from all over the world to the, for the hospitals, and even the hospitals are all affected um, because of uh, the current pandemic, which is there. Um, but on an uh, overall, this thing, uh, in terms of business, in terms of revenues, on them this year was not bad for digital. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Uh, your digital business is, uh, from what I understand, three large pillars. One is obviously your news business, which stands uh, the tallest. And then there is the classifieds business. And there's entertainment, which also includes the OTT piece. And, you know, videos also kind of cuts across all of that. And as I mentioned at the start, uh, Malayalam Maroma has been a company that's kind of pioneered from the, you know, regional news space, being a pioneer in the digital business. Would you like to tell us a little bit about you know, when the digital part of the business was set up, because, you know, when it was set up, I'm sure most of the companies in India did not, you know, not know what digital was. So what was the kind of vision behind setting it up and, you know, how did it happen? 
So actually, Manorama Online was set up in 1997. Uh, we had uh, Prince Philip had come uh, to India, and he's the one who inaugurated the uh, our the English website, theweek.com, which is part of our magazines, uh, which we had. And uh, since then, we started it. Uh, it was started off as an HTML website, and then of course. By 2001, we had launched it as an overall one-stop shop, content shop for Malayalis all over the world. The idea being, uh, from the beginning, the whole vision was, and the vision was actually that of, uh, uh, at that time, our 90-year-old uh, chief editor, uh, Mr. K. Matthew, who said that, listen, uh, I, I love my newspaper, uh, and it, it, it is my history and everything, but I think the future is digital. And we need to look at it very seriously. And um, it was soon after that I had come in from uh, New York at that point of time. And he was very keen because he, he, he was sure that this is going to be the future. And even then, at that point of time, we looked at digital as something which is not going to be just, let's just try and let's just putter around with this thing. But to look at it very seriously and see what it is um, that it can do for everybody. And... Um, that it had to be a profit center on its own. It would not be one of those which is, uh, let's, you know, and Manorama works like that, that it cannot just bleed like that and put a lot of money in there and let's see where it goes. So we started a very small, an extremely small team, a hungry team which wanted to prove itself. Um, and we kind of built up as it went. And the whole trajectory at that point was we first started off because we were uh, Kerala and Malayalis, and you know that Malayalis are all over the world. Uh, um, they say that if you go to a chai shop in Antarctica, you're going to find one Malayali there also. So we first targeted um, the Malayalis who were outside of Kerala because that was a low hanging fruit for us, obviously. Um, and once we kind of realized that there was great traction for this product, and um, again, it goes back to the nuances of Kerala, right? So Kerala has always been that state which is interested in news, which is interested in having their discussions on news. Life revolves around, uh, you know, all this uh, opinions and politics. So um, it, this kind of this product evolved around the, the, the Keralite mindset of, you know, just that, which is uh, how do we get people to sit and talk and be part of the news process. And so even then we realized that, uh, you know, it, is not, it, it could not be one of those places where, like the fourth estate of the past, we kind of give the news and leave it there and that's it. So even very early on uh, in its raw form and its basic form, we decided that we need to have news, which is kind of also comes in from our users. Users had to be part, had a, needed to have a stake in the product. Um, and then as we kind of developed the product, we realized that, you know, there are other things, you know, we wanted to try different things. Uh, mobiles, I think we started a mobile product in Malayalam in 2005, uh, when at that point of time, in one of those Nokia phones, you know, at that point, nobody talked about apps. And you yeah. used to be one of the web website, yes. Exactly. So, you know, and then we went on to do our, uh, you know, we, we, we did uh, Apple phones, we did uh, skill sets in Kin, um, Amazon. We, the whole idea was, you know, go out and try and try and try and experiment as much because it was still very early stages and we wanted to kind of, and our whole philosophy was experiment as much, fail in things which is not going to work and find things which is actually going to work for us. And, um, that was the mindset going in, and when we looked at uh, when we looked at uh, Manorama Online per se, we kind of looked at see this product um, Malayalam Manorama the brand and where it stood in Kerala. And Malayalam Manorama the brand, if you um, as you would have said that you know we have fifty different publications, we have television, we have radio, which came actually subsequently, but. Um, this product kind of spans the entire lifespan of uh, people. So we have a children's magazine onwards, we have things for uh, literary products, we have travel products. So the idea was that Manorma Online would harness the power of all these things that we have and then bring it to people um, in the format that they want. See, right? So now a lot of things, for example, classifieds. I mean, classifieds was considered to be Murdoch used to define uh, classified as the gold rush of, of, gold, uh, of newspapers. And somewhere, I think, in the whole excitement of uh, internet and all that, we completely forgot that this particular part was, you know, absolutely the most important part of newspapers. And a lot of newspapers, I think, um, had a tough time because, you know, Craigslist came in and took away a lot of that part of the business. So when we looked at our users, we said that, you know, we need to get something for our users for everything so that it's products that they can use. It's not just, yeah. just one one kind of dimensional relationship, but it's a multi-dimensional relationship that we built with the users. 
And that really is the crux of the uh, concept of Manorama Online, which is bringing the users to the brand in every which way, the way they want it. So tell me, uh, it was very early days for you know digital news in India in the early 2000s. And as you rightly said, that Manorama is not a company that will keep you know, pumping in money with some so-called and, you know, distant uh, monetary goals. So what made the company, the group invest in digital, especially at that time when digital advertising was a small pie, uh, technology still required investment. Uh, one part is understood that the world was moving digital, but there was very little money to go around. The pie is still even small today. But at that time, what made the group you know, put its kind of muscle behind it when, you know, there was very little business in it. Like I said, see, there was a, there was always a, the, the vision that this is going to be the, the product of the future. But when we invested in the products, the things we invested in was, we didn't invest in 100 people. We invested in five people, but five very good people. Right. We insisted on in, uh, investing in very good technology because uh, the first version of what we launched, um, actually the technology was great, but uh, you know, the partners at that time, like you said, were very new to use the technology and it was a mess. And I still remember uh, one of my biggest uh, failures in life, I always say is, you know, I, I had just come from New York and I was launching this new product and it was all this fancy CMS and all that. And uh, the entire Manorma was there for the launch. <clears throat> and five minutes before we pressed the button, because we'd already announced in the newspaper that the, you know, the site is coming up, the site crashed. And I had no idea what to tell this, you know, whole bunch of expectant people that, you know, we're starting out this new future and guess what? The future is crashing around me. Um, so we learned a lot of lessons in the early years. Um, so even though there's good technology, you need good people to build that technology and use right. that technology. Um, but we were very cautious about how much we spent. And we were not we were not kind of loosely doing that. So we were thinking through this whole process. Expenditure was equally as important as revenue, and we were also very conscious about revenues, right? So we 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 did feel that there was there was money in the market that we needed to get, and it was um, being a first uh, you know mover in this. We had that advantage of being helping to teach the market along with us what this product is. And I think that's what happened. A lot of, uh, we had a lot of people who we, we sat and we explained what this product is and got them in to sell it and exp experience it. And in the early stage, because again, like I said, the early stages was a lot of people outside of the country and um, using the product. What it was in the early years was that um, Manorma as a brand was, uh, you know, if, if a brand advertised in the paper, people knew it was legit, right? It was a, it was a legit brand. But a lot of the um, children of um, you know, parents who are living here were outside the country. So they would see the advertisements in digital and then they would kind of call their parents and say, listen, I saw this. Uh, what do you think? And the parents would say, oh, yeah, of course, it's there in the newspaper. It's kind of so it, it kind of tied together the print and the digital tied together. And um, so we got a lot of traction from our revenues, even in the beginning. I, you know, I remember in the first month or second month, it said we got our first advertisement um, and we were so excited about it. Uh, but, but also we were very clear that this is a product which had to sell. So there was no, there was a time, you know, when, it, when you talk to marketing people and when you started up, we only had, I only had one, uh, you know, marketing per, salesperson in uh, online. Um, so I would talk to the print people and say, listen, please send, sell digital as well. And the first thing that came was, okay, we'll give this for free. And um, one of the things that we said from the beginning was, no, we will not give it for free. It is not going to be, so it has a value. It will not be an uh, uh, you know, add-on. Okay, listen, I, you, if you take this much of print, I'll give you this for free. So we were very clear about that. So even in terms of now, if you talk about today's uh, day and age, we talk about networks and direct ads. We're very clear that direct advertisements are the ones which are, is the way to go. Networks is not the way to go. Um, and I, I know my sales team sometimes kind of, uh, you know, get very upset about the fact that I keep pushing. No, no, no. You need to get that. Networks is only backfill 20%, 30%, never more than that. Um, but we're insistent on that, um, that that's the way to go. And um, so it is a constant balance. Uh, there are, of course, there have been years when our expenses have been much more than our revenues, but those are the years when we kind of uh, spend more on investments for technology, understanding that that will help us in some process. But we've kind of, you know, even in terms of workflows, we've worked on the workflows in such a way that 
Um, editorial team gets a lot of, uh, you know, is empowered to do a lot of things. Uh, we don't, unnecessary waste is just not kind of uh, encouraged. Interesting. Two, three things. Uh, interesting that you elaborated so well. I'm going to pick you up on the revenue and the investment part again, you know, when we come to the OTT piece, because that's kind of the equations are very different there. But just for my understanding, and I've seen this happening across many uh, news companies, especially print companies where, you know, digital has been run by a separate team in a different silo. And typically what has ended up happening is uh, editorial and news is kind of uncoordinated, if I can use that word. Business teams are kind of scattered all over. Uh, there is no one kind of broad philosophy. And especially, I ask this question, Manorma has been a brand which has stood for editorial ethos, right? Uh, the newspaper, I, I know that the newspaper was shut during the freedom struggle and it has a very rich legacy and history. For a company like this to one, get into digital early as you explained, and then to kind of, you know, bring the news pieces together of print and digital, what kind of effort did it require? I mean, it's like in, in everywhere else, uh, it's not an easy sell, right? And uh, you, you throw to that somebody who's uh, coming and saying that this is your future and it might be also, you know, going to take away your future. It's not, it's not the best way to start your relationships. Uh, but I think, um, I, I think a lot of things we did was, uh, one was this concept of convergence, right? Even before it became the word of the day, um, we, we insisted that the editorial team was very much part of the decision-making uh, decision uh, system of Manorama Online. So we were very particular. We, one, the ethos of Malayalam Manorama, we did not want to kind of change at all with digital. And, you know, there, there is temptation because when you change it, and I know for a fact that if I do a lot of stories, which uh, I, uh, some of our competitors or other sites do, my numbers would be three times or four times. Um, and it's sometimes my younger uh, editorial team will always say, listen, why can't we do this? Let's push it a little bit. But we have been very particular that this is what we stand for. I mean, journalism uh, for, uh, with a cause, you know, our content has its ethos. We don't want to kind of break that uh, element of it. So we've kind of worked, uh, I won't say it's a seamless experience, but uh, we do a lot of work with the print team and we uh, kind of, you know, there is a lot of give and take, there is push and pull in all this relationship. But uh, I find that, uh, especially in the last few years, it's become so much more easier because now the acceptance of digital is much there. I, yeah, in the first few years, it was more of we giving the ideas and they kind of saying, okay, fine. But now, you know, we get so many ideas from the print team itself that it's we are finding it difficult because it's really good ideas and it's their product so yeah now we're finding it difficult to kind of respond to all of them because uh, you know this everybody wants to do something interesting tell me how do you compete with the external world when as you've seen what happens with digital news there is no sanitization right you have all kinds of content and for good or bad people are also consuming that content and for a newspaper brand with this kind of legacy there are a lot of content areas that you won't venture into. So how do you compete with that world outside where, you know, it's, it's for lack of a better term, an unlevel playing field, so to say? But you know what, we, uh, having said that, in the last uh, 20 plus years, we've seen that good content always uh, brings, in, brings back the customers. And the customers are coming in are the loyal customers. They're not the customers who are, you know, so now, for example, and you're going to talk about Facebook and Google and all those things, but when we see our traffic, for example, again, like uh, the whole marketing piece, even our traffic piece, we insist that our traffic, we, we try and get most of our, at least 50% of our traffic from direct traffic because uh, we want them to come for the product, for the content. And that's what we, that's the kind of loyal customers who come back again and again. They are the ones who are going to be there on our website throughout. Um, the ones who come from say a Facebook story or you know one of those more interesting stories, are the ones who are going to be there for under 30 seconds. Um, and the other ones, therefore, we have people sitting, for, our average site is sometimes 10 to 12 minutes because people go through so many pages. So, so let me come to the next piece, uh, Mariam, which is, you know, which is again something I've seen uh, a large number of uh, print companies not do successfully, not just in India, but globally, which is, uh, you know, transform their mainstay of revenue of classifieds into an online classifieds business. And as we've seen the classifieds 
business is very fragmented now owned by multiple companies real estate is owned by you know three four large national players uh, so is matrimony so is other businesses malalal maruma has been fairly successful at, at that what is the recipe for that success again persistence and trying to convince the french team that this is what they should be looking at in the future um, you know when we used to start in the beginning i would uh, sit in marketing meetings and i would say you know uh, print is dead and digital will come and sure enough the next person after me would be the classified uh, head of classified they say what she's talking is rubbish and print is never going to die um, fortunately for me he became my best friend and partner you know uh, very early on when he real when he realized he said that you know what there is some truth to it so let's try it out um and so we started off our uh, venture into m for mary uh, our matrimonial website 12 years ago we started this um and the traction we got immediately was unbelievable you know we really did not think that this was the kind of traction we would get um and we were not the first um, movers for this particular market obviously there was already other competitors in the market but um because of, with the manorma brand and the the trust which comes with it and matrimonial being such a big element trust being such a big element of matrimonial um and for mary quickly became the uh, number one brand for matrimonial in kerala and um, we also kind of got into the process of uh, teaching people how to use them for mary how to use matrimonial websites and um, in the last uh, maybe 2 3 years ago was when the digital revenues took over the print revenues in terms of you know uh, till then the print revenues uh, matrimonial revenues were still uh, more than the digital revenues and the last few years the digital revenues took over and now we've um, expanded to outside of kerala we uh, we just this year launched in um, the other southern states of karnataka and pradesh telangana and uh, tamil nadu because we felt that there was a attraction for this product and it, it was something which we could expand in what see when the classified business started shifting from print to digital a lot of players were made, able to make a national mark so whether you have you know matrimony you have real estate kerala is a unusual state in that sense where you know local players have held sway So what differentiates Kerala from other markets? Of course, there is you know early investment by players like Malayalam Manorama, persistence as you call it. But the national players who made you know headways into the large national markets also have deep pockets. They've also tried hard in Kerala. So what's been the difference in Kerala according to you? I think the brand Malayalam Manorama and what it stands for. I mean, uh, it really has made a lot of difference because uh, the the. the readers of this brand uh, the people in kerala have a, um, are very connected to this brand and it is it is not about uh, it is not so and they're so possessive about the brand in that if we do anything wrong they're the first ones to correct us and say listen this is not the way to go this is not how you should do it so we have been very uh, careful about what we do and how we do it and uh, that really has made a lot of difference in the kerala market and also because It, it you know there is a lot of uh, in all these products there is a, there is a certain amount we 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 are lucky we also have the largest media vehicles when we launch the product we have the paper to kind of do it now we have television we have radio so it does help in that sense it you know even if we don't have monetary investments uh, which uh, the other big brands have we have the vehicle to kind of reach our uh, our uh, users so th- that helps as well and as uh, you know and i think at the end of the day it goes back to the product you have a good product and you you have a product which uh, talks to your people and that's really where even you know from the beginning manorama has come from which is it's a regional brand and we've talked we've always been niche we've not been we don't want to go to the white noise of i mean when everybody is there there's a lot of noise going on a lot of things your attention is kind of diverted to a lot of a uh, lot of places um newspaper everything we've kind of said that this is this is this is our market we know our market we understand our market we know the people here yeah? this is where we can this is what is uh, our strength very relevant point let me come back to the news piece now and uh, you know subscription revenues has been uh, you know important for print players in kerala unlike you know some of the national players we've seen what newspapers globally have done the ones that have kind of you know made a go for subscription revenue have survived the storm the others have not so much uh, digital news is a very different kettle of fish not uh, many companies have managed to crack that code 
there are baby steps indian companies are taking what has been malayalam manorama's experience in that area so we thought we would go into this whole digital uh, subscription revenue phase very early on which was i think maybe 10 15 years ago when we launched our e edition we thought we should give it for pay um, and honestly at that time uh, it was not the lack of people who wanted to pay but the lack of a good payment service engine payment engine which kind of uh, made us uh, within a few months we kind of turned it off and we said listen everything is free because it's just not possible for us to charge it's, it's, it, there were no good uh, payment engines at that point of time but eventually uh, when we started going into our magazine products uh, and those are niche products we said that see the nag magazine products for example vanita which is our highest selling um, magazine in the uh, and largest circulating magazine in the country we did not want to give that away for free we did not want to even and so we were like even if there is a website which is uh, we were going to have as of now we have the e editions of it and we started off uh, paid i don't remember when but i'm thinking 6 7 years ago at least um and we were very particular that okay the niche products are going to go behind a paywall we haven't figured the paywall thing is yet uh, but whatever it is if you want to see this product you need to pay for it um and uh, that's how we started uh, two years ago even the e paper uh, went behind the paywall uh, because we said that you know there was a huge traction for it and people were willing to take it actually there were enough and more people who said this and put it behind a paywall we were, were willing to take it we had talked to our uh, customers and a lot of them were willing to kind of pay for it um and now um you know honestly as you said that, you know with with all that is changing in the industry and what is going on if you i mean if you look at yourself i'm sure if you see me on your phone i don't know you probably don't even know how many apps you're paying for how many you know services you're paying for you know there a lot of times when people are, uh, tell you and say that listen i i'm trying to see where my you know the small small payments going to these small small apps which uh, you started off and you're not even stopped using so i think the uh, with the with the coming of netflix and um, you know amazon prime and all people have started getting used to the concept of paying um uh, and that's the natural transition and i think even for us we are we are um, like other companies in the country and in the world we are looking at going somewhere into pay uh, maybe in a year or two years time maybe um because really that is the future because you want there will be a bunch of people who will only want free but there will also be a bunch of people who want who will, who are willing to pay for certain extra uh, services that you're willing to give them and um yeah. frankly speaking you know the this whole concept i mean it, uh, i think the media industry shot itself in its foot but not but not taking its content seriously and thinking that it should just go out there for free when you know there's a lot of money being invested in this content i mean if you look at it uh, if you look at it um it's easy for us uh, you know when we say because we're we're taking a lot of the content from print there's a lot of money being spent out there there's a lot of good journalistic work going on there so if you want to continue with that we need to invest in that and to invest in that we need to get revenues and that scale and right now digital is not making the scale of revenues uh, that uh, say a print is making i think uh, when it comes to uh, subscription revenues publications in kerala have still had be- had it better because of their forward looking thinking otherwise if you look at some of the uh, players in some other regions and english players they've not really managed to monetize and one is not sure now when it comes to print specifically uh, whether the you know bus is already left because now for one to increase cover prices and try to monetize it again there are too many fragmented sources of information uh, one has one of the other interesting things i uh, uh, i noticed or i uh heard uh, you speak in an interview where you spoke about cannibalizing self right which is about you know kind of disrupting your own business or doing multiple things you know we do that all the time in our business our team sit together on the same table and they say oh why are we doing this we have something similar going on already it's like a gc doing you know three channels which are mass entertainment which is kind of disrupting self over the weekend uh, last weekend i read this book by bob iger which is an autobiography called ride of a lifetime It's where he talks about book. disrupting his own business yeah. unless you disrupt and cannibalize your own business uh, somebody else will right absolutely absolutely i mean i i that's the reason why we kind of try out everything so you know whatever we hear in the market we we will if we think that it works for us and if it if we think it's going to make sense we try it out the concept being that you try early and if it doesn't work you fail and you fail quickly 
and then you pivot. So I mean, even in terms of classified, we've got so we launched so many classified products. We launched an OLX kind of product, which we finally said, listen, this will never make uh, money in the future. Why are we wasting our money on that time on that? But we tried it out uh, because we thought uh, we had a coupon-based product, uh, which we call end a deal, uh, which we just kind of stopped recently about six months ago, because uh, we really truly feel that you know instead of somebody else coming and disrupting your uh, business model, it's important that you kind of try everything that works for your readers. And the main thing in all this is to understand your customers, right? And kind of see where they're going and kind of follow them and see what works for you as a company when you follow them. Because a lot of things which they want to do, maybe you cannot do as a company, but you must try it out and then kind of see whether it, it kind of works with you or not. And if it doesn't, it's fine. You, the important thing is to also take the decision the right, not to kind of be so fast or hold on to things. Um, you have to kind of say, okay, listen, uh, I tried this. Uh, it did not work the way I wanted to. I need to let it go or I need to pivot. Um, I think sometimes we get so attached um, to things that we create that we kind of say, okay, no, we cannot do anything about it. And that is when we have issues, really. But if we, if we can kind of pivot or let go, I think it's an important, very important thing that we should try and disrupt. You see, even in terms of editorial thinking, I mean, every time, you know, it's a tough sell, you know, when you think. But you have to say, you have to get the print guide or, or the guy who is writing text now to think about voice and talk about videos. I mean, uh, because that's where it's going. You cannot just say, listen, I'm only going to do text because that's, not the future is something else and you have to start thinking through that as well let me pick you up on the subscription revenue thing again what's your outlook on that you know uh, we also saw during covid times times of india has partially gone behind a paywall not like full on but you know they put parts of their thing uh, nationally business standard has been uh, behind a paywall part paywall for a while hindu has done that uh, what's your outlook for the paywall industry in india digital news paywall uh, is there opportunity for a significant upside or do you think there is enough options for the consumers quickly to jump to the, you know, because eventually what we are looking at is a, you know, critical mass of consumers coming on. There is no doubt some will pay, but really you want millions to pay. Otherwise, you know, it doesn't work. Um, very early stages still. I think uh, the reason being that uh, the Indian industry is a lot different. Print is, uh, is, is still a very strong part of the Indian industry and uh, media industry. And I don't think it will go away that quickly um, in the future. So, but I think also that people are recognizing the value of subscription-based products. You, you know, frankly speaking, I have people even telling me, listen, you give me a product which has no advertisements and I'll pay pay." <laughs> pay for it you know as simple as that so um i think i think there's a demand for it like you said right now it's the it's the lower hanging fruits who people want to come in for but i think in the uh, in the next uh, few years you're going to see more and more publishers going behind a paywall yes i think so too uh, but the jury is out in terms of you know how much uh, subscription revenues will come in let me now come to the uh, you know newest part of your business which is the ott business and, and that's again an area where, you know, fresh content investment is required. Unlike print where, you know, you started with a significant base of content. Here you're doing two things. One, obviously you're taking uh, content from your news television business. You're bringing content from your uh, entertainment TV business. At the same time, also putting in, uh, you know, original content investments. Uh, there, are, there have been a lot of OTT kind of models across the world, as well as in India. And as terminology goes, we call them s word, we call, call them a word. What's been Malayalam Manorma's experience? We know you launched last year in September, so it's been exactly a year. So COVID is not the time, right time to get the right kind of experience in this area. But short duration, 12 months, what's been your uh, experience of the OTT play? So um, for us, like every other product we started, uh, we don't believe in starting, like spending a lot of money in starting it. So we start small um, and we had certain goals which we were hoping uh, that we would reach. And uh, frankly speaking, I don't know whether it's COVID or not, but it, we've achieved much more than what we thought we would achieve. Um, we we're, we have, as of now, uh, I don't want to say the word you used uh, earlier because, uh, because you have people now listening to me, but we have a combination of an A word and an S word model. Uh, that is, uh, frankly speaking, the model which we have right now. And it's, it's working uh, because uh, there, is a, there is a, like I said, there is an element of the, uh, people who want to see something which are niche and different and they want to see it at the time they want 
um, the way they want it. And there are others who are willing to wait for it. So uh, our particular product is uh, based right now on this. I know eventually it's going to go into, uh, and like I said, we, it's still very early days. So we cannot kind of say that one is better than the other and where are we getting more money from, um, just because it's still uh, experimental stages. Um, but yes, the, to, to get new content is a lot of investments and uh, we're, we, we do realize that and we are playing it um, like everything else cautiously and understanding our market and kind of trying to see how it works. Uh, frankly speaking, even the strategy of how to place the content, what kind of contents, the old contents that we've been bringing in, um, also a lot of uh, you know, films and all which have worked for us, it seems to be working for us. And it, it's also, also things like a reality, um, uh, engaging reality TV, you know? So um, that seems to be, you know, like Konbenega, Kuropati kind of thing, where you're getting them to kind of participate in your process of uh, thing. It's um, baby steps, uh, still very early. But having said that, I think the team is very happy because uh, they managed to achieve a, the number they set out for September, they've gone beyond that, um, far beyond that. So they're very happy about it. That's fantastic to know. Uh, but if you look at the OTT piece and the kind of digital you know, web piece, so to say now, you know, both of them are converging somewhere, right? Uh, OTT is primarily video driven. Your web pieces are still, you know, they're a combination, I would say, of text, voice, video. Uh, and at some point of time, you know, all of these pieces will start emerge, uh, start kind of converging completely so that you have one engine which is delivering content for the users, whether it is, you know, text, voice, or video. Uh, staying on the OTT part, uh, uh, Mariam, We've seen nationally, you know, OTTs now have been in play for, India has now, I'm told 32 OTTs, some 32 OTT players. And Kerala has also become a, you know, market that is competitive in many ways. Uh, large national players are present, Malayala Malorma is there, there are other players also there. Eventually, you know, this space will require significant content investment, right? So right. are you geared up to do that? Say, if you look out three to five years from now, because running a piece, which is completely feeding only of TV content might be a good start, but you know, it might not sustain you uh, beyond, you know, no, one, two years. Yeah, absolutely. We have, we have uh, I mean, our, our planning process includes uh, original content. We already have a couple of, a uh, few, um, you know, web series and original content, which we've even won awards. Um, so definitely that's very much part of the mix of uh, the content that we're going to have. Obviously it cannot be just uh, what is there on, uh, television, um, both for Marvel, which is our entertainment channel and MFTV, but we have additional content and that, that is, that is going to be a future investments are going to be in that, uh, stream itself. And, uh, are you already taking content investment decisions for television, keeping, you know, what works on OTT in mind or that kind of. Uh... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we started doing that, um, when we started thinking about the OTT process itself. So even while we were building the product itself, we started thinking that, okay, this is, this is going to be our future. So we need to kind of figure out our content based on that. Right. And tell me, give us a view from Kerala in terms of, you know, how the kind of, again, the S word versus A word play will work because, you know, globally as well as, let me take Indian examples, for instance, most of the OTT plays that initially started were. Uh, for some time, award driven, and then they became S word for some time, then back to award, and now they're a combination. Last I heard, now Star has put AP, a, a, IPL behind a completely S word model. This year, IPL is not available to you know viewers for free on uh, Hotstar. So everybody has been kind of dabbling with both the models, doing a kind of hybrid, uh, you know, combination of model. What's the view from Kerala? What are you you guys thinking? What is Malayala Manorma thinking on where the market is going? Frankly speaking, it's still too early, but I'm one of those people who doesn't believe in Kitchenese. Uh, you know, I don't believe that you can do, you can continue this A word and S word model uh, for a long period of time. You either, I mean, at some point of time, all of us will have to take a, a you know, put a stake in the ground saying, this is what we need to do. Um, and that is going to probably take a while though, because it's still very early uh, for us to kind of say that this is where, what will work for us. Um, you know, 12 months and that too in these unusual times is really not time for us to tell you. I, I can't actually say that is it S-word or A-word that I want to go. Uh, because I think in another couple of years, 
the time if you come back to me, I will tell you exactly what is the model which will work for us. But uh, we're experimenting right now, so very early. And from a, a cannibalization, again, I keep going back to the same theme because, you know, eventually business are built by, as, as you yourself believe in uh, self-disruption. Does putting content free on OTT place cannibalize your TV business in some manner? There is, of course, a line of thought which says that, you know, it helps popularize and uh, deepens the affinity with the content. But at the same time on OTT, if you're giving that content free, at some stage, the viewer will start getting weaned away, especially because, you know, OTT is not by appointment. So, you know, the thing is that, okay, fine. So this, these customers you're talking about, I mean, this is a conversation where I have regularly with every different product, right? radio or print or whatever, uh, and this whole concept of cannibalization, because I truly believe in it. Because if these guys are moving away, they're moving away for a reason. And if you don't have a product out there, they're going to go to somebody else. So, uh, you know, you might as well give your product, give your product the first uh, shot to kind of, get them to come there. It, it really doesn't make a difference. Uh, there's no point in holding on saying, listen, if I don't do it in this, um, I'm going to save my uh, old uh, legacy media. It's not, it doesn't work like that because if your customer has moved on somewhere, your customer is going to find that, uh, that you have to go where the customer is. You cannot force the customer to come to you. I sometimes feel that a lot of times people are trying to say, listen, I want you to do this and you're going to do it this way. I, you know, even as a customer myself, I'm not going to let anybody tell me how I should use, when I should use, or what I should use. Each of us is different. And, and you know, in all the products, if my own usage, look at your own usage, you don't like to be dictated upon. So why should you dictate on, to somebody else then? I think fair enough. Fair point. Uh, customer is evolving and, you know, eventually. The other important and interesting aspect of OTTs that we've seen, you know, in some of the larger, you know, national plays, if I can call it that for lack of a better word, is that a lot of OTTs have now become aggregators. So they are, you know, they are aggregating and buying content from everywhere. Uh, they're not run by specific, you know, media groups or television channels, if I can call it that, and they buy content across the board. Is that a trend that has started in Kerala already where you are, for example, are you putting content on your OTT, which you are, buying from, you know, for example, competing television channels. Is that happening? Um, competing television channels as of now, no. But we are buying uh, stuff from everywhere else, but we not, uh, not competition so far. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to pick up some audience question now, questions now. Uh, so there's a question from uh, Raju Nair, uh, which says, great to be here. I too hail from Kutayam, the headquarters of Malayalam Manorma, and this is a pioneer in Kerala. I believe as Kerala plat uh, transforms, perhaps a need for a trade stroke, stroke business journal that highlights development and potential of Kerala and not just political news. I'm sure Malayalam Manorma is uh, covering quite a bit of that. You want to, you have anything to say on that? So, yeah, I, I think uh, we do have a gap on business journalism. We're building on that part of it. Uh, we have something called uh, Sambadiam, which is our, uh, which is our uh, business magazine. It's a personal finance magazine. And uh, in the last one year, we've kind of uh, expanded on that. And we're working on that to be, uh, you know, that more developed product. And your main paper anyway does business coverage, but that is limited because largely limited. Everything. But we have uh, magazines which kind of uh, do more focused coverage, and that's where we're going. Like I said, we take content from everywhere, so that's and uh, that team is now developing fresh content for. So the way online works is that uh, you know from it's changed a lot in the past. That uh, initially we start up most of the content was coming from the print products. Now we have 30% of the content coming from print products and we have an additional 70% which is done by the online editorial team because we need to obviously give a lot more than what is there. So right. um, business is one of those elements which we are now developing, focusing and developing much more on. Fantastic. Another question on Manorma Max. How are you gearing up to handle competition from national players including the likes of Amazon, Netflix who are also looking at regional content? We, the same way as we gear up for national players for every product, right? I mean, we feel that uh, we need to, know, we understand the pulse of the people and our, our users. And we are, uh, I mean, we can never compete in terms of, uh, you know, if you, even if you talk about uh, Facebook or Google, you want to talk about, which is, we can never compete in terms of the money people invest in. We can only compete in terms of the 
quality of content, we can compete in terms of the knowledge of the users. I mean, these are the ways we compete. Uh, we, and, and the fact is that at the end of the day, you need to know your users well. Uh, that really is finally the, the crux of the issue. And, and you have to have good content. So we feel that with those two, the combination of those two, we will be able to compete with all the national players. Interesting you mentioned that. Let me now pick you up on that issue that uh, we thought we'll also discuss about, you know, how Facebook, Google, using content curated by news publishers have kind of run away with the agenda and also with the money pie. Enough and more has been written about, you know, what could have been done and what's been run wrong. But if you were to offer, you know, two, three kind of uh, fixes, so to say, what would they, uh, they be? What, would, what could, for example, the digital news publishers do to get their fair share of revenue from the digital advertising ecosystem See, um, and compete better with like, Google and Facebook. If I knew a fix out there, I would be, you know, I, I, I would sell it to the whole world. I can only say what we, uh, what we believe in. Um, I, I mean, Google and Facebook is, is like this, uh, you know, huge uh, wheel which is trying to take over the entire world and it's, we're all very small pairs compared to that. Um, I think the uh, the way, like I said, uh, finally at the end of the day, you have to believe in uh, the product, right? And you have to kind of say, uh, I will not be dependent on, say, a traffic, right? My traffic cannot be dependent on Google and Facebook because they keep changing this so-called algorithms of theirs, which is this black box, which they think is the greatest and which sometimes makes no sense uh, whatsoever. Um, and or they it's, it's, and it keeps changing, right? So if you're going to be dependent on those two to get your traffic, you're in trouble. First of all, you need to build a brand where you can say your traffic is coming to you directly. Similarly, even for revenues, I mean, if you're going to start working on, you know, say that 70% or 80% of my revenue is coming from networks, then you're you're gone. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to say, listen, I have a product. It's a good product. And I want you advertisers to come to me directly and you're not going to get me through networks. So if you want to come to me, you have to come through me. I mean, it, it's simple things like even aggregators. We're not in aggregators. We're not in a daily hunt because we truly believe that, you know, if you want to see Malala Manama, come to Malala Manama. Don't go to a daily hunt where my product is a commoditized product with somebody else and you won't even know which is my content versus somebody else's. And 90% of the time, half the other products there are uh, cut and paste of our products. You know, so... Uh, we don't want to kind of be that. So you have to at some, you have to say that, listen, you have to find your niche and then excel in the niche and sell the niche as what it is. I think very relevant also uh, that dovetails with your point about, you know, uh, directly selling rather than, you know, going through platforms because the passion that your own sales team can bring to the table when you're dealing with advertisers, no faceless, you know, programmatic platform can bring to that. Let me move to the next question from Ashok Vidya Sagar. It says, what do you foresee as a break-even point for OTT? If you only create originals and what kind of investments do you see going in for Malayalam Norma OTT? Still very early, so I'm going to refrain from commenting on that one. Let me ask you a larger piece. Say, you know, we are sitting in 2020. Uh, five years out, uh, what, do you, what is your assessment on how much would digital revenue be part of your group as a percentage? We don't want exact numbers, but where would the rough ballpark be? Five years out, um, if subscription and all comes through, I, I would think that it would be a significant percentage. But until we do subscriptions, it's never going to be equivalent uh, anywhere close to, see right now, uh, print revenue, digital revenue is about under 5%, under, uh, you know, of, more in all of India is like that, right? Under five to ten percent of uh, print revenues. Uh, but uh, with subscription products coming in, I think it's going to be a significant percentage. Uh, are we going to be the uh, larger percentage, like in um, in Europe and America right now? No, we, it will probably take you longer than five years. But um, I think it will become a significant portion of revenues. Tell me, what do you think the government can do in this? Is there, does the government have a role to play? I know you guys also formed the Digital News Publishers Association two years back, which has got, done some interface with the government. Is there? So but why I ask this question is, for example, Australia is bringing in a law which requires, you know, Facebook to pay news publishers for the content that goes from there or share revenue, right? 
is that something that you know would you like to happen in india or what else can the government do to kind of kick start the ecosystem absolutely i think the government uh, needs to kind of get involved in this to understand that you know uh, at the end of the day um, you know it's easy for everybody to come in and say we're this conglomerate we're not liable we're not see we are held as a digital pub as publishers as print legacy publishers we are held to the highest standards uh, you know we have if we are you know everybody monitoring us and we are uh, you know responsible for a lot of things and every other platforms per se will just say like listen we have nothing to do with this content we have nothing to do with how we place the content you know and they are not liable for any of these things so as a result anything can happen i mean case in point is we you know i remember uh, when we had the kerala floods and you were talking about the kerala floods um you know it, nowhere in google despite the fact that we were the first first ones to be uh, you know we are the largest we are everything in the first two pages of floods our search uh, you know no content from us was ever came out and so i remember calling the head of google at that time rajan was heading google at that time i said listen what are you doing because what is happening is there's so much of noise out there and you know content which is false going out there um that uh, people are then our phone numbers are jammed our emails are jammed because people are calling and saying is this a fact is this true and we're saying no it's you know and we're constantly correcting the notion so when you have this and when there is so it's, it's completely not controlled it's 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 in a mess out there and it's it's detrimental for the people in the country as well when this happens and if you don't take responsibility for it whereas we have to take responsibility for every little word nuanced as it is then it's you know it it is a responsibility of the government to come in and take over and say listen there is there is a value to this product and that it's important that this be protected because you know at the end of the day behemoths can come in and kind of uh, steamroll everything but is that what you want at the end of the day and government in not only australia all over the world in america and uh, in europe is taking you know sitting up and kind of taking notice of this thing this is what is happening and we definitely expect uh, the indian government also to kind of uh, you know take our side on this one i think very very we're okay we're okay with whatever you do but you know hold us in the same standards that's right don't don't hold us in different standards from someone else absolutely and i think very relevant point especially uh, during covid times i remember uh, during the peak of the lockdown and curfew uh, news that would come from a established known newspaper brand would be the only one believed because you know whatsapp forwards and you know digital news has become so overwhelming and overpowering today and there's so much floating around that we finally all fell back on, on you know newspaper news to confirm whether you know something what was true or not so i think if covid has proven one thing it is that genuine news and credibility of that uh, has become even more valuable for customers and how the how the newspaper brands now you know kind of utilize that over the next few years as you said will determine whether we can uh, uh, make any subscription meaningful subscription revenues uh, let me pick up another question uh, it's an interesting one uh, uh, let me just summarize it it's a long question you are into so many things you know the malayali so well why not an e-commerce product uh, <laughs> investments there are huge um so we we again in the in the phase of experimenting we had actually signed up with the at that time one of the first few e-commerce people in kerala uh, in india um india mart it was by the shivar by dinesh agarwal dinesh agarwal is a friend yes dinesh agarwal started india mart correct so uh, so we we kind of tied up with them and you know we we thought we would go into e-commerce and it was one of the things that we did think about but uh, frankly speaking uh the investments are quite a bit and we thought we'll first expand into the stuff that we know uh, we we know content uh, we still don't know we don't know e-commerce very well and we, you know there's a lot of money involved and then we, we're uh, we're safe company so we don't we're, we're not yet ready to kind of put our foot there and say okay listen we were, we're going to invest in this and then wait for all the money to come in and uh, burn a lot of money which is just not our style person <laughs> enough another question according to you if there is one big change that you would see in the future of online news consumption what would that be sorry what is the big change you would see in online news consumption going forward say 2 years out 
I think online news consumption will move more to uh, video, more to uh, voice. Um, that's what it's going to go into. Um, long form news is going to be of interest to people. I think people are already, uh, you know, realizing that that's what is, uh, that, that is something which they want different. Um, uh, it's basically we are more, you know, formed of multi-formed approach. By the way, I just want to correct myself. It was not India Mart, it was Fab Mart that we had signed up <laughs> right. uh, by the there's another question. Uh, many media houses in India are family driven. Manorma has been credited with running various media platforms within the group more as a corporate. How is the next generation of the family looking at the business? How is their involvement like? So we're still very much professional driven. We have uh, professionals uh, heading most of our, uh, you know, organizations. Uh, I am an exception in that I have, uh, I am part of the family, but I'm uh, heading this business. But uh, um, in general, we have, I mean, I have a very good team of professionals who are actually leading this uh, in terms of content, in terms of marketing and technology. Um, the, the next generation has also been very, you know, everybody's gone to get trained everywhere. We worked in other places before we've come back here. Um, and we truly believe that this is an organization which has to be run by professionals. We cannot, you know, kind of uh, let it be one of those uh, where we sort of, indulge in everything. All our role is to kind of support and to kind of push uh, the professionals who are working. And frankly speaking, Malala Manorma is the hard work of the team members. It really has nothing to do with any of anybody else. Our next one, while Manorma is headquartered in a small town of Kotayam, it has created waves for being a front runner in many good practices, including employee training, education and also healthy work-life balance while maintaining market leadership. How much of this can be attributed to being a small town big brand or a brand that values relationships, stroke people over commerce? We um, I think it's come down to a generation that the most important thing in, in, uh, in this brand is relationships. It's not employees. We don't have, rela we, it's not that we have, uh, <clears throat> in fact, one of the first things that we talk to people who join us is that you know, we, we're not having a relationship only with them, but with their entire family. We, I mean, we truly believe that um, if if you are coming into our company, it is not only you, but it is your your spouse, your children, your parents. They're all part of this Manorma family, and uh, um, and that's how we've tried to build in the culture, which is which is the reason why we probably have uh, you know a lot of our employees are third generation and fourth generation employees. Um, it's that connection that we've had over the uh, past uh, years, and that's something which we, which we really value. It's very important for us. It's it's really not like I said. It for us, it's not about if if it was about the traffic or the revenue, then there would be a lot of things that we would do differently. It's for us. It's about the journalism, uh, what we bring to the table. That is what is more important for us. Absolutely, legacy brands are built on values. Uh, traffic and revenue is a byproduct of that. Uh, next question. Uh, can you tell us uh, a unique aspect of Malayalam readers that you've capitalized from a business point of view? Well, that might be a trade secret, but here's the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, well, my, I think Malayalam readers, what I see is that if you can tell them that there is value in what you're giving, then they're willing to accept it. Um, I think they're willing to try different things. I think they're willing to accept value, um, but you have to convince them. It, it's not that easy. Uh, you cannot just kind of say, uh, I'm giving you something because they're very particular about what they get. Uh, and they definitely have very clear ideas of what they should get. So um, you cannot give them just anything and get away with it. Um, that way, they are very finicky about it. But uh, if you can convince them, then they are your supporters. Our next question uh, from Unni Krishnan BK. Do you think digital platforms are getting its due share from the market in terms of ad revenues when compared to print, TV, or even radio? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, it's very small fraction. Um, but I think, uh, I think COVID has changed a it a little bit and that people have realized the kind of traction we're getting. And uh, interesting when, interestingly, when, you know, the peak of the lockdown, we had some people who decided that, you know, local people 
uh, retailers and decided they should try out uh, digital and they found it uh, that it made a lot of difference to them you know to do to do that so you know uh, you never know it I, covid may have may have been that point which is the inflection point which is now going to help the uh, digital revenues again it cannot it's not going to be banners uh, so it's it, it's really you know it has to be a lot more uh, different from uh, than banners we have to be more innovative about it and how to get the it it just cannot be plain vanilla stuff it has to be innovation i think if i were to add on another point to this there is part about you know digital not getting its sort of you know if you talk to a tv guy he might think that you know digital is getting uh, getting a larger share than deserved the other part of the equation is also whether vernacular is getting its fair share of revenue when it comes to digital as opposed to you know languages which are you know more mass in nature say a hindi or a english especially english is always punched above its weight uh, weight uh, for natural reasons but i think uh, vernacular news especially vernacular digital news as a you know has a lot of work to do in terms of going and convincing national advertiser to look at it very differently i think it's seen as a small piece uh, add on monies are put in there and i think a lot of convincing and work is required to be done in that area because you know unlike in the past today uh, in the regional space anybody who's reading a, a vernacular language has money to spend to buy those brands no absolutely and uh, so for kerala uh, you know we can we also show the fact that you know the response which comes from vernacular sites is far better than the response which comes from uh, you know national uh, sites english language sites even facebook and google for that matter and we've done those experiments so we have those case studies to show how you know the response is far better in terms of the customer which is there and so i mean even for us i mean uh, when it comes to revenues it's 50% national 50% local so um i think people recognize that it is a lot more push it should be required i think you're right uh, that actually this is not even uh, this should be premium uh, forget about the fact that you should be advertising that this should be premium advertisement because really the kind of response you get from vernacular you're not going to get from any other um, segment that's right uh, we are out of time so let me just take two last questions uh one is kerala is no more malayalam centric do you see yourself catering to the english speaking malayali in kerala through digital yes so we have an english website it's called on manorama uh and we have uh, we have now in the last few years got a significant traction of revenue for, uh, traffic for that understanding that that is uh, that is uh, that is a set of people who will want to be part of uh, the malayalam ecosystem or kerala ecosystem so definitely we are we have english products which is already there and more on the pipeline and do you also look at uh, you know getting into other regions because you know unlike print where you have to set up elaborate teams and printing centers and offices digital can be done with you know smaller teams so are you also looking at expanding into other languages in the region in south india for instance so content so far we are not getting into but with our classifieds we are moving into other other languages so like i said empomary is already launched into the other states um the other classified products we are looking into um content not yet fantastic with that let me thank you mariam thank you for a very candid and honest chat and let me also tell you uh i spoke with a couple of friends before this conversation and the the one overriding theme i got from them was this is a group that gets it when when it comes to digital so congratulations on earning that tag uh because that is that is a that is a tag very few media company especially legacy media companies in india have earned uh thank you for being part of this for those of you listening thank you for being part of this on a friday evening i hope we made your time worthwhile uh before you go away just a reminder monday we have a chat in the evening under the exchange media conclave series with the ceo of times now mk anand that's again at 5 o'clock you can check out our zoom links till then stay safe and enjoy your weekend thank you for joining us thank you very much thanks everyone